Many of the mad lads that we've talked about are fundamentally tragic stories about desperate people trying their hardest to improve their lot in life only to fail in a devastating or hilarious fashion. It's just a sad fact of life that even the smartest of us can't win them all. No matter how skilled you are or how airtight your plan is, things often just don't work out for those that deserve it. However, the exact opposite sometimes happens. Every once in a while, a complete dribbling idiot comes along and stakes absolutely everything he has on something even dumber than monkey pictures. And it inexplicably pays off. An absolute mouth breather that kept failing upwards on little more than a whim until some people began to suspect that he might actually be a genius. Until his next overwhelmingly stupid investment. A complete gibbering moron that could somehow bet everything on yellow and still win. The great-great-grandfather of Wall Street bets. Lord Timothy Dexter. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. But before we get started, it is in fact your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. I think a lot of us grew up collecting some kind of card game, magic, Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or sometimes all of them if you were rich enough and now with Raid people are creating a digital collection of all of the unique champions the game has to offer and since there are over 600 of them there are plenty to collect. On top of that you can upgrade them, collect artifacts to make them even more powerful and find the perfect synergy with other champions. And Raid wants me to open some shards for you, and remember if you do the same and you get a bad champion, it's still useful because you can actually sacrifice them to level up your already beefy champion. So, there isn't really such a thing as a bad shard. <laughs> Look at your mum. <laughs> <coughs> no, I think I'm still what? That's fine, it looks like he's a bit of burn some heretics, but you know, I can fix him. Uh, there's a purple one, but that's fine. That's fine. Marksman. No, that's good. He has mental HP, so that's good. Seducer. <laughs> Can kind of tell that with a complete lack of shot. Big mass summon. Big summon. Oh! I just get two legendaries. Ha! <laughs> there you go. Alright, smashing. Jeez, oh, I should just get two legendaries. And this month is an extremely important one for Raid Shadow Legends because of the release of a brand new faction called the Sylvan Watchers, which include some amazing new champions. This faction is made up of forest elves, ents, druids and fays, and I look forward to summoning them all in-game. And if that's not enough, as always, Raid has got a full lineup of events, along with the new season of the Forge Pass where you can get some of the most powerful gear that the game has ever seen. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. So remember to use my link down in the description to download Raid for free on your phone or PC. And if you would like a starting boost in Raid Shadow Legends, then hit the link down below or scan the QR code on the screen to get unique bonuses worth $30. That is 200,000 silver, an XP booster, an energy refill, an ancient shard and the epic champion Aina so you can summon a great champion as soon as you get into the game. These rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days, and you can find these rewards here in your inbox. Timothy Dexter was born on the 22nd of January 1747 in Malden, Massachusetts, and he was the son of Irish immigrants. As a boy of 
very limited means, he had to drop out of school at the age of eight to work the field as an indentured labourer, which left him pretty much illiterate. Fortunately, however, the young Timothy's destiny wasn't eternal serfdom, and he went on to become an apprentice leather tanner at the age of 14. Once qualified, Timothy moved to the city of Newburyport in 1769 to set up shop and seek his fortune. And it was there that he met and married a relatively wealthy widow named Elizabeth Frothingham, who was nine years his senior and also a mother of four. You know, it's like continuing from someone else's save point, with the marriage exchanging Elizabeth's seed capital for Timothy's well, seed. Timothy set up his tanning business in her basement in Boston, where he would sell hides, blubber, moose hide trousers, and gloves. But Timothy wanted more. Timothy found himself envious of his wealthier neighbours, and he wanted the fortune and prestige that they had. So he set out to take his first step on the societal ladder and got political. Sort of. Timothy noticed that all of the neighbours that he admired were all involved in the political scene, which convinced him that he needed a position of his own to become their peer. So, to secure his place in public office, Timothy took the approach of a true politician. Being really fucking annoying, Timothy wrote letter after letter to the local powers that be to ask for a job, and he refused to stop until he got one. His handwriting was atrocious and the content of the letters was practically gibberish, but Timothy sent so many letters that the local government office ended up drowning in paper. Any desperate bid to get Timothy to shut the fuck up and stop sending them letters, they just decided, fuck it, whatever, fine, here's a job, and they made Timothy the informer of deer. Now, for those of you that were not born yesterday, this is a completely made up and invented role, it's not real, this is something that they just pulled out of their arses to get Timothy to stop annoying them, but also make fun of him at the same time. Timothy, however, was very proud of his success, and he took this job very seriously. And this job involved sounding the alarm whenever any deer were seen in the area. However, there had been no deer seen in Newburyport for over 19 years. But Timothy didn't know that. So he just assumed he did a very good job. So that was the political ladder sorted. Now Timothy just needed money. While the leather business was going pretty well, Timothy knew that he needed to be more proactive if he was going to make the fortune he required to accompany his new political clout, if you want to call it that. So he got straight on that Sigma grind set and started to ape into whatever he could find, hoping that something would turn him a profit. Timothy's game plan was to keep an eye out for any goods that were in short supply and then buy all of them, hoping that the laws of supply and demand would kick in and he could jack up the price and resell them. And surprisingly, Timothy had a surprising amount of success with this. So much, in fact, that local merchants actually started to become apprehensive about selling him their stock in case the value rose like Timothy expected. But then basic reasoning skills kicked in and they almost always sold the goods anyway. After all, why would such reckless speculation by some random idiot that clearly has no idea what he's doing actually pay off? Timothy's net worth was steadily increasing, all according to plan. However, there was a snag. The local elites that Timothy was working so hard to join were seriously rubbed the wrong way by everything about him. They hated him. They fucking hated him. 
so much. They hated his crude, obnoxious and distasteful nature, but they mainly hated him because how dare this village idiot think himself equal to such esteemed gentlemen as themselves. I mean, look at him, grinding away to his heart's content, trying desperately to fail upwards to their rank and privilege that they worked so hard to inherit. You know, but they earned their position, damn it. So, to preserve their veneer of superiority, they tried their damnedest to set Timothy up to fail, partly out of jealousy and partly as an amusing prank. Through some cunning financial advice, they were going to take advantage of how naive Timothy was and ruin him. They encouraged Timothy to hoard continental dollars that had been issued by the fledgling American government to pay for the revolution. However, these were barely more legitimate than Gregor McGregor's Poirier dollars because, as we all know, fiat currency is worth about as much as toilet paper. The only thing holding it up right now is, well, belief. You just gotta have faith. Actually, uh, these dollars were worth less than toilet paper, come to think of it, because 240 million continental dollars had been issued throughout the war, which in the 18th century was an absolutely outrageous amount. So, just by existing, continental dollars devalued themselves substantially. But then the British threw a big wrench in the works by flooding the market with counterfeit notes. Within five years, continental dollars were worth one fortieth of their face value, and eventually they were completely worthless because no one would accept them anymore. Now, I could give you a big lesson about supply-demand economics when it comes to currency and inflation, but I don't need to. You're all going to find out the hard way soon enough. However, none of that occurred to Timothy. All he really thought to himself was, wow, how nice of those guys to give me such a lucrative tip. They must really like me after all. And then Timothy spent all of his own and his wife's savings, you know, real money, to buy up all of the continental dollars he could get his hands on, barreling straight towards bankruptcy. But after the Revolutionary War, something unexpected happened the newly established US government decided to honour this fiat currency at 1% of its face value, causing its value to skyrocket. Timothy's net worth equally exploded overnight, and compounding this stroke of insane luck was the fact that Timothy had also bought a bunch of European currency that greatly appreciated in value once the Revolutionary War ended and trade with the old world started back up again. In celebration of he and his fledgling nation's fortune, Timothy Dexter gave a speech on the 4th of July, 1793. And for some reason, he gave the speech in French. Timothy Dexter cannot speak French. He gave an approximation of what he believed French to be. You know, fu fu fi fi hon hon baguette. And in this speech, Timothy accidentally wished the audience good breeding, piety and wine. As one can expect from such linguistic limitations and the fact that it's Timothy Dexter we're talking about, I'm sure that very little of substance was actually said after he essentially blotted out the 18th century equivalent of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Timothy then used the substantial profits from his ye olde crypto trading scheme to buy two merchant ships, named the Mehitabel and the Congress, which allowed Timothy's insane antics to hit a fever pitch as he started to export goods to Europe and the West Indies. After receiving another tip from his rich friends, Timothy used these ships to send over 40,000 bed-warming pans to the Caribbean. You know, those big spoon-looking things that you fill with hot coals and put under the bed to keep it warm in the winter. 
those things that are absolutely fucking useless in the Caribbean because it's the Caribbean, it's fucking hot. Well, you would think they would be useless over there. But the ship's captain came to clutch and he marketed them as molasses ladles. And the Caribbean was a huge hotspot for sugar manufacturing. So the venture actually turned into a great success and they sold them all. In fact, Timothy managed to get a lot of repeat business out of the Caribbean, where he later sent Bibles that were completely useless until Christian missionaries arrived just a few days before the shipment. But while Timothy seemed to be on a real hot streak, his next investment really pushed his luck. Wool gloves. After the success of the warming pans, Timothy decided to send wool gloves to the Caribbean. And since you can't really MacGyver wool gloves into anything useful on the fucking equator, Timothy would have been fucked the moment they hit the market. However, they never made it there. So what happened? Did the ship get wrecked in a storm? Was it attacked by a crew of terribly disappointed pirates? Or were the gloves bought en route by Asian merchants on their way to Siberia? Well, it might not be that last one because some sources say that the merchants were actually Portuguese. But regardless of who bought the gloves, Timothy inexplicably made a tremendous profit yet again. The man just couldn't stop failing upwards to insane fortune. But then he did something that was wildly unexpected. Something that was truly, truly shocking. Timothy Dexter did something smart. On purpose. Newburyport had a massive stray cat problem, and the local government voted against killing them all. So, no one knew what the hell to do. Until Timothy stepped up and said, I'll take them. <laughs> for, for, for some fucking reason. So, Timothy filled his ships with a horde of captured stray cats and shipped them all to the Caribbean. Which just so happened to have a massive rat problem because they arrived on the ships and whenever rats get into a land where there isn't a rat population, they just explode. So, Timothy sold all of these cats to the plantations as pest control for their warehouses as well as selling them to other ships to prevent rats from getting on board. The man, the man literally herded cats, literally herded cats, and, and it paid off. It paid off. I mean, sure, sure, fuck it, why not? Timothy's next big play came about when he overheard a conversation where a sailor was complaining about the scarcity of stay stuff. So, Timothy put his speculator hat on and bought 340 tons of whale bones. <laughs> which, which is a fucking lot of whale bones. And in fact, it, it was all of it. It was all of the whale bone. Timothy completely monopolised the whale bone market because he bought all of it. <laughs> but why? But <laughs> why? Why the fuck did he buy whale bones? Because when the sailor was talking about stay stuff, he meant rigging. You know, the apparatus that holds ships and sails and all of that stuff together. What the fuck does that have to do with whale bones? Well, this actually helps us understand how Timothy Dexter's mind works. This sailor was looking for stuff that holds ships together. So Timothy thought to himself, ships hold together. Ships go in water. What else is in the water? Whales. Whales. Whales are in the water. What holds whales together? Bones. Whales have bones. If bones can hold whales together in the water, then bones could also hold ships together. I will buy bones. <laughs> oh, this man's a fucking... It didn't take long for Timothy to realise his fuck-up. 
with his investment plan in Tatters, Timothy's diamond hands had failed him. And he decided to sell the whale bones at a 75% markup. Because in monopolising the entire whalebone market accidentally, it meant he had no competition. He was the only guy with whale bones, so he could sell them for any price he wanted. He made a massive profit yet again. By some fucking miracle, Timothy was just in time for whalebone corsets to go into fashion. So clothing manufacturers bought up all of his whalebone at his big inflated price. I d- I don't, I, I don't even have anything to say. Furious about his success, Timothy's peers then threw an idiom at Timothy, telling him to ship coal to Newcastle. And everyone knows that that phrase simply means to carry out a pointless task. Now, I know what some of you yanks out there might be thinking, what's the problem? Everyone needed coal back then. Well, I don't know if you're a history buff or not, but Newcastle had the biggest mining economy in England. Coal was its biggest export. Trying to sell coal to Newcastle would be like trying to sell snow to Canada. Or trying to sell war criminals to the Balkans. But anyway, coal mining was so big in Newcastle that even Boston was importing the stuff from there. But as we all know, Timothy wasn't burdened by an overabundance of schooling. So, he actually did it. He actually shipped coal to Newcastle, blissfully unaware that his ships were going to be laughed out of the British port and leave him ruined. Nope, sake, bamboozled, that's not what happened at all. Timothy made an absolute fuck ton of money yet again, by yet another stroke of ridiculous luck, when Timothy's boats arrived, the miners in Newcastle had all gone on strike causing a coal shortage. So, the city was actually very grateful to have its own coal sold back to it. At this point, Timothy's neighbours and peers just need to shut the fuck up and take the L and stop trying to ruin him with fake advice because it just backfires every single time. With his wealth well and truly secured, Timothy was finally on the threshold of the Boston upper class. He had the money, he had the political clout, if you want to call it that. He had all he needed. Except for charisma. After all that effort, Timothy was rejected once and for all from the upper echelons of society for being a massive, arrogant dickhead that no one liked. Which is kind of strange because you'd have thought that would have helped him fit in with them. Eventually realising that he was disliked by the local elite for a lot more than just his humble background, Timothy gave up on trying to hang out with the cool kids and instead moved to Chester in New Hampshire in 1796. However, Timothy was not there for very long because his personality resulted in a local lawyer beating the shit out of him. Now, you know what Timothy's character is like, so this beating could have been caused by any number of reasons. Timothy had styled himself as the Earl of Chester, and he insisted that everyone call him Lord Dexter. Which is obnoxious enough to make anyone punchable, but all of the locals seemed to just let that slide. What had actually drawn the wrath of this particular lawyer was Timothy allegedly tried to fuck his wife. And we will get into why that might just be true later on. Timothy made his return to Newburyport, where he would go on to become stronger than ever. You see, he learned the wrong lesson from his humbling experiences with the would-be peers that he looked up to so much. So wrong that the experiences weren't actually humbling at all. Timothy finally realised that money talks. And it was saying, what the hell do I need those pretentious wankers for? I have money. I can do whatever the fuck I want. 
Timothy wasted no time in buying a big, lavish house overlooking the sea that was worthy of a lord such as himself, and he referred to it as his princely chateau with tasteful and commodious outhouses. Because, God forbid, Timothy learn a lesson and put his ego aside for five fucking seconds. However, the public actually went along with his lordship bullshit, because... They actually found all of Timothy's batshit insane antics really funny. So they just kind of egged him on. You know, like the special kid in class that thought he was a superhero and then you tell him to jump out of the window. Brian Flanagan, I'm sorry. I was only 13, man. I didn't know any better. But anyway, that doesn't mean that Timothy didn't put in the work to make the LARP convincing. He spared no expense on this place, and he even had a library put in just to look clever. Uh, He didn't actually read any of the books. (laughs) And some of the books were, like, really, really valuable, but they weren't kept in good condition because Timothy very often defaced or tore them. Other affectations that Timothy bought for the house included some lovely cream-coloured horses for his carriage until... He got bored of them and bought grey ones instead. He also had a great big mausoleum built for he and his family to be buried in when the time came. And it was completely decked out with mahogany caskets that were all lined with silk. The caskets were so comfy that Timothy would very often sleep in them whenever he felt like he needed some peace and quiet. Which was pretty much all the time. But all of these accessories were nothing compared to the most famous part of the estate, which in true Timothy Dexter fashion was also the most tasteless. He had 40 15-foot columns erected around the garden and topped with garishly painted statues that cost $2,000 each. Now, if you're going to spend 80 grand on a bunch of statues, then they better be of some very important people. And to be fair, they were. Featured in this sort of ye olde Madame Tussauds was a selection of Indian chiefs, military generals, philosophers and politicians who were important at the turn of the 19th century. These included George Washington, John Adams, Napoleon, King Louis XVI, Ben Franklin, Lord Nelson, and King George III. Thomas Jefferson was also included, and in true Jeffersonian fashion, he courted a little bit of controversy. As the statues were being put up, Timothy noticed a painter writing that Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, which he did. However, Timothy argued with the poor man because he was certain that Jefferson had actually written the US Constitution, not the Declaration of Independence. But Timothy soon went off in a huff after the painter stood his ground, because he was correct. Then, Timothy came back with a fucking gun. (laughs) With, With a gun and fired a shot in the air. Then the painter just said to himself, you know what, fuck it, I'm not getting paid enough for this. And he corrected the inscription, saying that Jefferson wrote the Constitution of Independence. However, this was not the only incorrect inscription on the statues. You see, Timothy was a simple man. A very simple man. So, he was very easy to amuse. So he very often swapped around the names on the statues for fun. Despite having a pretty huge and luxurious estate to run around in, Timothy preferred to spend most of his time in a very common refuge for most rich people. Up his own arse. Because the last statue was of himself. He'd given his statue the place of honour right beside George Washington, and his statue's plinth was inscribed with, I am the first in the East, the first in the West, and the greatest philosopher in the Western world. But what wisdom did Timothy have to make him worthy of such an esteemed epithet? Well, 
Fortunately, Timothy was generous enough to share his enlightenment with us by writing what he called his little book. Little spelled E-L. This text was titled A Pickle for the Knowing Ones, or Plain Truth in a Homespun Dress. Some considered it a memoir, others can make a case for it being a sort of manifesto. I personally believe it was just a diatribe of whatever was on Timothy's mind when he sat down and started writing. At 8,847 words, it's more of a pamphlet than a book, but frankly, I'm just impressed that Timothy knew enough words to fill such a document. Because remember how I said that Timothy was basically illiterate? Well, not only is this book just a bunch of faux intellectual I am 12 and this is deep garbage, but pretty much every single word is spelled wrong. The thing reads like Chris Chan having a stroke. And... I don't know what possessed Timothy to create such a thing. Compounding the book's complete illegibility is the fact that there is no punctuation at all. None whatsoever. The entire thing is just made up of paragraph-long running sentences that received many complaints from readers. But despite his massive ego, Timothy actually took this criticism on board and released a second edition that had all of the necessary punctuation on a single page for, for readers to pepper and salt it as they please throughout the book. Timothy, Timothy really said if you don't like how this reads then fix it your fucking self. However, that didn't stop the book from being a massive success. Timothy initially gave it away for free and it proved to be so popular that it was reprinted eight times. But let's not get caught up in the book's style over its substance. What was Timothy trying to tell us with this fever dream? What was A Pickle for the Knowing Ones actually about? Well, that is a fantastic question, and if anyone actually manages to figure it out, please let us know, because we literally have a team of researchers here. <laughs> literally, a team of researchers, and none of them could figure out what the fuck Timothy was trying to say. The book's opening is it's, it's certainly something. Uh, right away, Timothy uh, sets the tone by declaring... To mankind at large, the time is come at last, the great day of rejoicing. Why is that why I will tell you the three kings is raised, raised, you mean... That's... Oh my god, this is like the eighth take. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just keep it in. Fuck it, I don't, I, I don't give a shit anymore. Raised, raised, you mean it should know raised on the first royal arch in the world, almost not quite, but very high up upon, so they are good mark to be seen, so the women like to see the front, and all people love to see them, as the Quakers will come and peep slyly and feel glad and say how they do friend. <laughs> How they do friend Father George Washington is the centre, King Adams is at the right hand. And and, and so on. Uh, now, we, we, we don't have time to unpack all that, but I, I think, I think what he's saying is that he is celebrating the newly formed United States and its presidents thus far, and for some reason he's also implying that Quakers are perverts. I... I think, I, I, I truly have no idea what's going on. From what I can gather, the text as a whole is something of an account of Timothy's career and whatever was on his mind at the time. Naturally, Timothy can't praise the protagonist of his autobiography enough, proudly stating, I'm the first lord in the United States of America, now of Newburyport, it is the voice of the people and I can't help it, so let it go. <laughs> Me. Uh, as part of this exercise in ego stroking, Timothy actually reveals the secret to his successful investments, which is so brilliant, so big-brained, that the English language itself clearly cannot comprehend the genius at play here. 
I'm just going to leave the text on the screen for a moment, just for you to take in. So just, just look at that. Look upon his works, ye mighty, and despair. Go on, see if you can make any sense of this. Try, try, I fucking dare you, because I guarantee that braver men have failed. One of my researchers is actually extremely well-versed in classical literature, and he had a fucking nervous breakdown trying to read and comprehend this. But, so his sacrifice isn't in vain, I shall read it aloud to you in as close to plain English as he could get it. If you'll excuse me for just a wee moment, just until I find the... Sorry, it's easy to find, you just need to follow the clear Asperger's. Okay. <clears throat> How did Dexter make his money in, he says, buying whalebone for staying for ships and grossing 340 tons, bought all in Boston, Salem, and all in New York undercover openly, told them for my ships, they all laughed, so I had my one prize, I had four cunning men of runners that sounded the horn as I told them to act the fool, I was full of cash. I had... <laughs> I had nine tons of silver on hand at the time. All that time, the creature's more or less laughing. It spreads very fast. Here is the rub. In 50 days, they smelled a rat, found where it was gone to Newburyport speculators, warned like hellhounds to be shot with it. I made 75% one ton and half of silver. Over one more, I dreamed of warming pants. <laughs> I dream. I dreamed of warming pans. Uh, three nights that they would do it in the West Indies. I got not more than 42,000, put them in nine vessels for different ports that took good hold. I cleared 79%. The pans made use of them for cooking. Very good master for good blessed good. <laughs> indeed, indeed, Missy got nice hands. Now burn my face. <laughs> Uh, the best thing I ever see in Bond days, I found I was very lucky in speculation. I dreamed that the good book was run down in this country. Nine years gone, so low as half price and dull. Uh, that, at uh, that, the Bible, I mean, I read, I had the ready cash my wholesale. I bought 12% under half price. That cost me 41 cents. Whack Bible, uh, 20,000. 20, I put them I put them into 21 vessels for the West Indies and sent a text and sent a text <laughs> The man was truly ahead of his time uh, that done wicked fly to the bible <laughs> wicked fly yeah, he is ahead of his time and uh, and on their knees and kiss the bible three times and look up to heaven and ask forgiveness my captains all had complete orders. Here comes the good luck. I made 100% and little over. Then I found I had made money enough. I had speculated since old times by government securities. I made or cleared $47,000. That is the old affair now. I told all the secret now. Be still. Let me alone. Don't wonder no more how I got my money, boys. Timothy Dexter. Truly one of the greatest minds of our time. But with his gift of the ways of the market also came a warning. Within this hallowed text was also a few words for Timothy's enemies and detractors. Unto you, all mankind, come to my house to mock and sneer. Why don't you laugh before God, or I mean, you better think the higher power. Don't know thoughts and actions. Now I will tell you, good and bad, it is not polite to come to see what the bare walls keep off my ground. If you are gentlemen, you would stay away. Come <laughs> I fucking can. Uh, a paragraph later, Timothy doubled down, writing, I want to make my enemies grin in time like a cat over a hot pudding and... <laughs> my god, this fucking video. And go away and hang their heads down like a dog been after sheep guilty. Like a dog been after sheep guilty. Um, I am not sure what Timothy meant by that, but I'm sure it was more than scathing enough in his own head. 
But despite the conviction of his remarks against his enemies, there was one thorn in Timothy's side that he found insurmountable. One person that he just couldn't abide at all. His own wife, Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, Timothy had a few choice words for her in his diatribe as well. Now, to all honest men, to pity me that I have been in hell, 35 years in this world with a ghost, <laughs> a woman I married, and have two children now living, Abraham Bishop married my daughter, since the trouble is such that words can't be expressed, nine years disordered for a ton of silver for three months, I could not have the ghost in my palace sleep, not have to be had. <laughs> Uh, the man, for, for anyone that's wondering, as I'm sure, as I'm sure very many of you are right now, uh, the man really said that not even a ton of silver could persuade him to put up with his wife for three months, and he thinks that his living situation deserves pity. But that's just Timothy's side of the story. What was Timothy's family really like? Well, to put it mildly, their relationship was really, 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 really bad. <laughs> it was really bad, especially between Timothy and his wife. There was probably quite a bit of resentment for her on Timothy's part because her family was really quite well connected and they probably looked down on Timothy for being, well, Timothy. And I can't say that I really blame them. Another problem came about as a result of the garden. Timothy's statues proved to be rather popular and they attracted a lot of local young women who would take it upon themselves to tend to the surrounding garden. You know, that's quite wholesome, isn't it? It's nice to see some local girls engaging in a hobby while making their area look nice. But all Timothy cared about was the bush in his garden. He noticed what was going on and he wanted to plant some seed of his own. He watched those girls working with the soil and he wanted to get down and dirty himself. Yeah, he tried to fuck all of them. He tried to he tried to fuck all of the girls that were in his garden, much to the chagrin of a uh, poor old Elizabeth. However, Timothy never actually got to see what else those green fingers could do, but I don't think that made much difference to his wife, who was constantly scolding him for being a fucking degenerate. Timothy eventually decided to handle his family issues like an adult by stomping around the house in a huff and accusing his family of conspiring to make him miserable. Eventually, this tactic got old, so Timothy just started to pretend that his wife didn't exist. <laughs> and he would tell people who saw her skulking around the house to ignore her because she was just a ghost. However... She was rarely spotted anyway, because she was rarely in the house. The place had quickly degenerated into a shithole due to Timothy, his friends and his son throwing raging parties every single night. Before their relationship broke down, Timothy and Elizabeth had two kids, though Timothy didn't get on much better with them than he did with his wife. The apple didn't fall far from the tree, so both kids drank heavily, you know because Irish. They, like their father, were also complete morons that were too stupid to do anything for themselves, despite the fact that Timothy spent a very pretty penny to get them both the best education that money could buy. Upon reaching adulthood, Timothy's dipshit son Samuel decided that he was grown up enough to strike out on his own, and he begged for a ship of cargo to go on his own trade mission to England. But, it soon turned out that while he had inherited his dad's IQ, he hadn't inherited his luck. Because Samuel gambled everything he had away as soon as he arrived in England. Timothy's daughter Nancy didn't really fare much better. She was pretty and wealthy enough to have a lot of suitors, but they all dumped her immediately after meeting her father. Noted. Nevertheless, she eventually managed to marry a scholar from Yale that impressed Timothy with his intellect. Not that that would be difficult to do, but the marriage was very unhappy. The scholar had married Nancy for her dad's money, 
only to discover that Timothy was a stingy bastard. So, after the couple had a daughter, the inevitable divorce left Nancy with nothing but bruises and an even bigger drinking problem. And when she moved back in with Timothy, she was forced into seclusion. As you can probably tell, Timothy's home life was an absolute shambles. So, in the absence of the family that he locked up, shunned and sent away, he surrounded himself with weirdos, poets and sycophants that he drank copiously with. And he made sing his praises at all times, almost literally in the poet's sense. However, as you would expect, these friends of Timothy's barely had a brain cell between them. The poet was actually a fishmonger. <laughs> the, 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 the poet was actually a fishmonger by trade who sold porn as a side hustle, and another member of the entourage was a fortune teller whose best friend was a chicken. Like, a, a literal chicken. Despite being a complete moron that gaslit himself into thinking that the sun shone out of his arse, Timothy wasn't totally incapable of introspection. Later in life, he found himself contemplating his own mortality. He found himself wondering what kind of legacy he was going to leave behind. After all, look at the state of all of his relationships. Sure, he had all the money he wanted, but what about that all-important prestige and respect? Did his entourage and community actually like him, or were they just sniffing after his money? Timothy needed to know that he was going to shuffle off this mortal coil after accomplishing his life's mission to be the local Chad. So, he carried out a little experiment to test what people really thought of him. Timothy faked his death. Then he bribed his family into going along with the charade and putting an ad in the local paper announcing his passing and inviting the entire county to the funeral. On the 14th of November 1800, Timothy then watched the characteristically extravagant show from behind the bushes, discreetly hidden away and ready to see all of the heartbroken faces and hear all of the nice things that everyone was drunkenly saying about him. Ultimately, the experiment proved to be a rousing success because 3,000 people showed up. However, Timothy wasn't satisfied with this. While he had the quantity of mourners that he wanted, the quality wasn't quite there because he noticed that his wife wasn't crying. Not only that, but he actually saw her laughing with other guests at the wake. Later on, after the main event was over, the sound of screaming in the kitchen blew Timothy's cover. Timothy had jumped out, revealed himself to the shock of everyone, and then for not crying and actually kind of looking a little bit happy, Timothy beat the shit out of his own wife with a cane. Eventually, Timothy died for real on the 26th of October, 1806, at the age of 58, which isn't very old, but considering how much he drank and how many people he'd pissed off, I'd, I'd say he had a pretty good run. In fact, it is believed that Timothy's relative longevity was thanks to his African-American nurse, Lucy Lancaster, who was essentially Timothy's babysitter through keeping his hedonistic impulses in check, keeping Nancy out of the public eye, and mediating arguments between the whole family, poor Lucy pretty much single-handedly kept the whole household together. Now, it must take one hell of a character to do that, and Timothy really thought that she was. For some reason, Timothy believed that she was descended from African royalty. So, in... True Timothy Dexter fashion, he might have been the first ever person to fall for the Nigerian prince scam. After Timothy's passing, it was revealed that he had bequeathed some money to the local poor, who were ultimately his only friends. In a surprising display of compassion, he'd even made sure his wife was looked after in his will. But, despite living a life of grandeur, he wasn't allowed to keep the gravy train rolling into the afterlife. 
Timothy wasn't allowed to be interred in the personal mausoleum that he loved so much, likely because having a dead body in his public garden was seen as unsanitary. Instead, he received a much more basic grave than he intended in the local cemetery. However, not every aspect of Timothy's legacy remains intact. The famous statues are long gone. In 1815, a storm damaged them and they were subsequently either auctioned off or burned. Although, I can't really say that that much artistic value was likely to have been lost. But while its most iconic feature is no more, Timothy's house is actually still there. Sort of. In the years after its owner's passing, it was redecorated a number of times, giving it a much more tasteful Victorian appearance. At one point, it was even converted into a hotel. But don't worry, despite the veneer of respectability, the place still managed to attract complete and utter morons. On the 15th of August 1988, the owners had some absolute cowboy repairmen in that tried to remove paint from under the eaves with torches. So they set the fucking house on fire. And the place burned to the ground. However, historic New England had the original blueprints. So, they were able to rebuild the house to the exact same specifications as the original. Probably because of its worth in terms of both local history and its multi-million dollar valuation. So, the story is over. But it still leaves us with one very important question. Was Timothy really as stupid as we're all led to believe? I mean, sure, he could barely read and write, but that was a very common impediment to have in those days. Could he have been smart enough to make his own luck, despite his illiteracy? Well, some people believe that the garden statues were actually just a stunt to drum up traffic for a nearby bridge that Timothy had reportedly invested in. As one Newburyport local put it a few years after he died, Though ignorant and illiterate, and doubtless somewhat indebted to luck for his good fortune, still it is evident that the man was both shrewd and sagacious. So, while we may never be able to know for certain, it certainly seems possible that Timothy's antics were an act and we were all just pawns in his own 4D chess game. But while this story, you know, sounds like a textbook case of crouching moron hidden badass, I think that Occam's razor might just win out here. As for me personally, I believe that Timothy Dexter was a gigantic raging <laughs> I think he's just a fucking idiot. He was just so stupid, but he just managed to get so lucky over and over again. And to be honest, I really hope that that is the case. Not just because it's funnier, but also because that's just the American dream in action, isn't it? After all, what is more American than a complete idiot who is in way over his head, but choosing to bluster his way through adversity like a bull in a china shop, and then inexplicably succeeding, just because someone told him that he couldn't? To me, that's inspirational. So, get out there and achieve your dreams. Even a penny is more money than you can count if you're stupid enough. If he can do it, so can you. No matter how hard the task is and no matter how stupid you may be, if Timothy Dexter can sell coal to Newcastle, you can do fucking anything. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.